Okay, so um, so this conference uh, is uh, focuses on holography and uh, uh, right. So this this conference uh, focuses on uh, holography uh, and mostly uh, theoretical in uh, terms of ADS-CFD and uh, string theoretical aspects of holography. Uh, the talk I'm going to give you is is going to be more uh, uh, geared towards uh, observations, although there are there are heuristic parts of it. Um, but uh, but basically, I want to see where we could where uh, holography or the, the theoretical aspects of gravity can meet uh, hard experiments, things that you can actually test in data. And traditionally, this was used to be done uh, in cosmology. At least people attempted it in cosmology because Big Bang that was the obvious place to do it. But now, in fact, we have a new tool, a new uh, window, which is gravitational wave astronomy. So I want to advocate that as maybe the place to look uh, or test uh, holography or other ideas in quantum gravity. Um, this, okay, so this is the outline. Um, so I'm gonna give you basically three pictures of black holes and I'm gonna at the end uh, conclude. Uh, so I, I, I had a, a longer talk, which I'm summarizing because I have only 30 minutes here and I think I'm, I'm losing my pointer now. Let me just see whether, okay, the pointer is back. Okay, so, um, nope, the pointer is gone again. Um, I think there is something I should do, and I forgot what it is, but there is some, um, yeah, anyway, so there's some option that I have to press somewhere so that I can see the pointer. But uh, anyway, so I, 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 hopefully based on my words, you can see what I'm talking about. There is no, not too much pointing necessary. Okay, so we're going to talk about black holes in gravity first, and this is, of course, uh, what uh, started with Einstein's paper. So this is the uh, picture of the first page of Einstein's paper on, uh, that introduced general relativity field equation. So, uh, so we all know that there are numerical simulations that show uh, mergers of uh, neutron stars, which is something that we expect to happen in nature can lead to the formation of black holes. So this is a numerical simulation from 2013. And this is a detection of that in 2017 in gravitational waves, um, which is famous um, by LIGO collaboration. Uh, the prediction of Einstein theory of relativity based on uh, simulations and uh, mathematical arguments is that uh, uh, in, in these situations, when you form trap surfaces, uh, the global structure of a space-time lead to formation of uh, event horizons. And as you know, that means that basically there are regions that are uh, the only possible fate for uh, observers who move causally is to be crushed by singularity if they're inside the, uh, the event horizon. Uh, however, in classical relativity, local observers experience no drama. And this is the term that's been used. Um, I'm going to come back to it. If you're outside the event horizon, you can escape. Inside, you cannot escape. But when you cross the event horizon, you don't notice anything, according to Einstein's theory. Uh, as we've heard um, in several talks, uh, uh, based on Einstein's theory, the notions of black hole thermodynamics have been developed. Their temperature, the entropy, uh, the first and second law. Um, uh, the real puzzle, which the, the previous talk really touched upon, was what states this, this entropy count, and that remains a puzzle to this day. And as, as you've heard, there are, multiple, um, there are multiple interpretations of this. Uh, however, if you just take uh, the, the picture that Hawking had, uh, he predicted that black holes will explode. Uh, and this is, I guess, a cartoon of that. Uh, so uh, it, it doesn't directly uh, follow from relativity, but it uh, follows from basically a combination of energy conservation and quantum field theory in uh, curved space-time, or so, let's say semi-classical gravity uh, and quantum field theory in curved space-time. So that is basically, the, uh, in some sense, the main stream, and um, that's what most people believe happens as uh, the black holes disappear after some time if they're left alone, okay? Uh, but then there is a different picture, and uh, incidentally, this is also uh, related to uh, Einstein's paper, only um, 
only five, seven months after the Einstein's, the other paper that I showed you that shows general relativity. And this is based, uh, this is a paper that introduces a stimulated, basically quantum radiation, in particular, a stimulated and a spontaneous emission. So, um, so Einstein, what he did is he introduced the notion of uh, quantum radiation and how uh, it's related, the rate of uh, emission, uh, a spontaneous emission, a stimulated emission, and absorption should be related to each other for system to have a well-defined thermal equilibrium. Uh, he, of course, didn't know about black holes at the time. Um, they would come later. Uh, but, at, but now we know that black holes are uh, excited quantum states, or at least we think if you believe in quantum theory, and they could have all these emission processes. But that leads to contradictions, and we're going to talk about that. So what's wrong with this story is what we've heard about is information paradox in its various forms. Uh, basically, the, the, the assumption that you have local physics and a smooth horizon lead to uh, apparent inconsistencies. And uh, we've heard about uh, some of them from Bernard. Uh, as Hawking, in fact, started this. The most recent uh, famous incarnation of it is the AMPS paradox, the Faraval paradox. Uh, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But there are uh, slightly more nuanced versions of the problem. Um, one is uh, quantum tunneling, that um, uh, basically deviations from semi-classical gravity uh, is expected to be exponentially suppressed. Uh, if you imagine the path integral argument, things that are very, very non-classical, uh, for big, the, if they're big, they're exponentially suppressed. But if you think the entropy is counting of the number of states, the exponential of entropy is also very big. So in fact, the product of these two is over the one. And based on this, Samir Mathur has argued that as soon as you form the horizon, you can tunnel to a very non-classical state. Uh, and this is counterintuitive, but it basically suggests that maybe the classical picture of uh, gravitational collapse uh, is not as uh, watertight as you may think when you form the horizon. Uh, and finally, in fact, how I, I got into this is uh, dark energy, that it seems that, in fact, you could explain the scale of dark energy by uh, assuming some sort of equilibrium between dark energy and black holes, uh, but that would remove the notion of horizon. Um, but we, I'm not going to talk about this anymore, uh, because uh, not nobody else is, but uh, this last, last idea. But these are kind of... A, 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 some of the arguments where you may, you may take as uh, absence of the horizon. In fact, uh, the last talk, uh, they have, uh, so Bernard has his own motivation for, for why there may not be a horizon and things inside the horizon are removed. So there are, in fact, uh, there are lots of different motivations. Um, none of them are um, foolproof, but uh, they're all kind of strong uh, motivations. In particular, firewall paradox, which, uh, which was talked about already, suggests that these four uh, key assumptions, uh, unitarity of quantum mechanics, uh, no drama that I mentioned, quantum field theory beyond Planck scale, and, um, and uh, the, the, the entropy uh, being uh, the dimension of Hilbert space, they are not all consistent with each other. Um, right, okay, so I'm just looking at this. Uh, very good. Okay, so, and this was by Almeri, Maral, Polchinski, and Soli, although Samir Mathur had a similar argument earlier, uh, four years earlier. Uh, now, what comes out of that if you, if you believe that things are not, I mean, black holes are not classical? Um, in fact, so this uh, is something that we actually put out just this week, so I thought I'd just mention this. Uh, now, there are different proposals for theories of quantum gravity. Um, a string theory is one that I'm going to talk about uh, later, but uh, this is in fact in a different proposal known as asymptotic safety, which was first proposed by Weinberg in 1978, where uh, the idea is that uh, gravity or Einstein gravity plus, um, uh, plus higher order corrections, or, uh, they actually have a asymptotic safe UV fixed point. Um, and, uh, Basically, the idea is that all the coupling constant have some RG dependence, uh, and if you look at the RG for all the coupling constant, there is a non-trivial fixed point uh, in the UV. 
So uh, that was the proposal, and we kind of took that, and then we identified that um, that UV that our GS scale with the local temperature uh, in uh, in a geometry in a in a spherical geometry or a local temperature, which depends on the metric uh, or uh, Tolman temperature to be more precise. And we, we basically extremize this action with this assumption that basically G and lambda are not constants anymore, but they have an RG dependent, they have a dependence on local temperature uh, based on what you expect from uh, asymptotic safety, basically. So G, is, G and lambda go to constant and, and a small K, but then become, have a certain scaling that you expect from asymptotic safety in the UV. And what we found, in fact, solutions uh, have no horizon. Uh, you have a very deep core, but not infinitely deep core, what you see at the right-hand side. So G00 doesn't go to zero. It, in fact, it does go to a power law, which is kind of what you expect from a UV fixed point. If you have a fixed point of normalization group, everything should be conformal or power law. Then. So this is what we actually uh, found. And uh, this is kind of one of the possibilities if you want to look at a quantum a structure uh, of a black hole. But of course, this is not. Uh, this is just one possibility for quantum theory, quantum gravity. Um, uh, another one is a string theory, uh, arguably the most popular one. And uh, the proposal for a structure of black holes in a string theory is called fuzzballs, uh, which is kind of similar qualitatively to what Bernard was uh, uh, painting in the last talk. Uh, uh, basically, a collection of longer strings. Uh, but in fact, fuzzballs are more concrete. They are uh, higher dimensional geometries that don't have horizons, but there are many of them. And if you can count them, uh, the, the idea is that you're gonna, uh, you can recover uh, because of Hawking entropy. Uh, and furthermore, uh, the spontaneous emission uh, from these, uh, these fuzzballs, in, in particular from ergo regions, leads to, uh, leads to Hawking radiation. So even though there is no horizon, you could still get Hawking radiation from, from this with the right properties of Hawking radiation. This was uh, argued by uh, Chadori and Mazur. Okay. So uh, now, if you get rid of the horizon, and as I said, uh, there are uh, general arguments for it, and there are model-specific arguments for it, then there is, in fact, a generic prediction. And this is what we call echoes from the abyss. So the prediction, you can see it in the picture on the right. That, so there is the angular momentum barrier, which is kind of the standard uh, gravity from general relativity. Uh, but then instead of a horizon, you put a membrane or a fuzzball or uh, whatever you may call it, or firewall, um, where things cannot penetrate. Uh, basically, there is physical quantum structure there. And what happens is uh, waves, it could be photons in principle, although there's a technical reason. If you ask me later, I can tell you why it doesn't quite work for photons. But in particular, gravitational waves can actually be trapped between these two barriers, between the angular momentum barrier, which is classical, and the quantum barrier, which is either fuzzball, fireball, or something else. And whenever you have, uh, you have a box uh, in which uh, waves can be trapped, then uh, you can get echoes. So in particular, you, get, uh, you can get signals that come out of the black hole from purely classical processes, but then they would, uh, at, rather than falling to the black hole, as is part of that single, signal part falling to the black hole, it would be reflected off of the membrane. Um, let me see, I mean, you could see it now. Uh, I think you can see my pointer now, right? So it, this is where the membrane is. Um, Right, so you can get reflection from the membrane and then part of it can come, get out of the angular momentum barrier and gives you the first echo. Uh, part gets back in, gets another reflection. So basically the same reason you get echoes in any other situation in an echo chamber, you get that feeling. Um, but this, in this case, this could be gravitational waves and it can, in fact, compute the time scale for the echoes if you expect this is a, a structure at the Planck scale from the horizon, which is what you expect, say, from uh, from Becker and Stein Hawking entropy. Uh, if you interpret the atmosphere or entropy of the atmosphere as uh, the, the Becker and Stein Hawking entropy, then this is where the atmosphere should end. And that's where you expect to see uh, the echoes. And the time scale turns out to be long, but only logarithmically long. So the time scale uh, for the black hole that was first observed by LIGO is around 0.3 seconds. 
uh, and something that you can go and look for. Um, so this is what we, in fact, uh, we first looked for, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. It was predicted and then searched for around the same time. And his prediction was by Cardoso, uh, Pani and company, and our observation, uh, our search was by Dahid Abedi, uh, who was a student at Sharif University, and uh, Hannah Daikar and myself. Uh, but then the next question is what you expect to see. Um, can I ask how much time I have? Uh, yeah, maybe maybe you have uh, uh, seven seven minutes. Seven Five, minutes. Seven minutes. Yeah. Okay. Seven. Thank you. Okay. So um, so this is basically, uh, and this is where holography comes in because uh, we want to know something about quantum gravity to tell what happens because it's quantum effects, right? Uh, now, I'm not going to be able to go through all these arguments by de for detail, well, in detail, but it turns out we actually came up with uh, roughly, basically, five different arguments uh, that are somewhat, somewhat independent, but give you the same answer, where there's a reflectivity, which uh, goes as a Boltzmann factor. Uh, basically, high frequency uh, waves would be uh, all absorbed, and low frequency waves comparable to the Hawking temperature would be mostly reflected. Uh, so this is, in fact, in line with what uh, Samir Matur calls fuzzball complementarity, where basically for a uh, uh, basically energetic or a small things, um, they just see a black hole, uh, like a standard GR, but when you look at big, big wave packets at the small frequencies, uh, the story is different. So this is kind of a movie of showing how this happens in, um, in the, uh, an argument, on, uh, I mean, it's not exactly like this, but basically the idea is that if you increase the dissipation, uh, you actually, that leads to reflectivity. And uh, if you imagine black hole is a dissipative uh, region, which is what you expect from a quantum system that absorbs things, it turns out you are gonna, always going to get some reflectivity from it. And that's, that's kind of uh, to be expected. You, there cannot be any quantum system that absorbs everything. Right? And we actually, from a, a specific calculation, we can get this uh, the Boltzmann reflectivity. Uh, you could show from basically Einstein's um, uh, stimulated emission and absorption. If you imagine a, spon a spontaneous emission is Hawking radiation, if you put things in an in a, in a, uh, in a environment with incoming gravitational waves, then you can stimulate Hawking radiation. And a stimulated Hawking radiation leads to echoes. Basically. So that's, that's kind of the argument. And another argument is, in fact, based on quantum information. And uh, if you want to uh, respect uh, uh, certain properties in, uh, uh, in, quantum inf in, in quantum information processing, that suggests that there should be non-trivial structure at the horizon. And in fact, uh, it suggests that you should cut off half of this Hawking, um, uh, this uh, eternal black hole picture. And if you just take that as space time and then look at uh, project it into uh, black hole coordinates, you see that you're going to get Boltzmann reflectivity again. Um, so how this happens is basically the idea, if you wonder how this reflection happens and how this could be independent of uh, the details, basically the idea is that there is, a, there is a Hawking radiation, right? So you can imagine there's a Hawking plasma of things or the Hawking atmosphere. And everything that falls into the black hole, in fact, first has to hit the Hawking uh, plasma or the Hawking atmosphere. Uh, and then that's where reflection happens. So the, the massive things or energetic things, they just uh, brush through it. It's like an aeroplane flying through the atmosphere. It doesn't care very much. Um, but uh, the low energy things, they cannot and they get reflected. And you could actually do the calculation, a reflection off of the Hawking uh, uh, atmosphere or the Hawking plasma, if you want. So we can do it actually explicitly with electron positrons. And then we get basically the same. Uh, so we did it in two different ways. Uh, and then you get the same formula, which is a Boltzmann reflectivity, which is, uh, it's not the same as what you get for gravity because you're doing QED, but it's, if you translate it to gravity, then you get the same result. Uh, so the other thing is the time scale for the reflection. It turns out that this time scale was first proposed by Sakino and Suskind in a, in a holographic context. Um, basically, the idea is that this is a time scale. The fastest things can be scrambled. The information can be scrambled. So 
this time scale happens to be exactly the time scale for echoes. So this is what my student Christian Saraswat showed that uh, basically what Saskin and uh, Sakino suggested is exactly the same time scale that echo uh, uh, happens on the variety of contexts, basically for different types of black holes with different criteria. Uh, and more recently, we looked at the holographic interpretation of this um, in terms of random matrices. And basically what we saw is that uh, uh, emergence of echoes could basically signal some non-trivial structure in the spacing of uh, energy states. And uh, you, uh, this is not something that people have considered, but if you kind of tweak what people have considered in terms of uh, the spacing of these random matrices, uh, if you add some non-trivial structure into it, then you can get echoes. And um, so that's kind of the holographic interpretation of the echoes is basically you have random matrices, but not entirely random. There's some, some type of a structure in the randomness, uh, which leads to echoes. And that's what an example of echoes that we saw. So, uh, so I'm, not, I, I'm running out of time. So uh, I'm just gonna say that we also can see this in CARE CFD. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a different story, but similar pictures uh, emerges. Uh, and basically, the lesson from this is, uh, uh, I would like to advocate that echoes to LIGO is like Higgs to LHC, that if you basically want to recover unitarity, there is a signature for it in particle physics, uh, and then there is a signature for it in gravitational waves, and echoes are those signatures. They're, they're not guaranteed, as Higgs was not guaranteed, but uh, they are very, uh, uh, very persuasive arguments for them. Uh, and finally, I guess in the last couple of minutes, uh, I just want to say that uh, we have uh, people, a lot of groups have searched for echoes, and there is kind of controversial evidence for it. Um, so as I mentioned, we first did it uh, in 2017, and we found some signal uh, from three events that LIGO uh, first saw with p-value of 1%, which is like two and a half sigma. It's not Earth shattering, but it's um, it's interesting. Uh, so this is with Jahed and Hannah, and most recently, just uh, I think two months ago, we we, we posted this paper where we uh, searched for these echoes, or this in particular now that we know much more about what we're looking for, or stimulated Hawking radiation, we actually looked for these Boltzmann echoes or stimulated Hawking radiation, and we saw evidence of it in uh, the biggest black hole measure event that's been ever reported, which has the loudest ring down. So in pr principle, you expect the loudest echoes in these. Uh, and as you can see to the right here, um, these are basically echoes that are predicted. Uh, so these are where you predict echo to see the echoes, first echo and the second echo. This is in frequency and time. Um, and uh, where you actually do see the based on the GR, the first and second echo here. The frequency, uh, you could also predict it based on the model, uh, based on the uh, horizon frequency. And we see signals that are consistent with that. Uh, so, so the p-value is again of order 1%, so it's not uh, huge. Uh, it's not the detection by particle physics standards, but it's there, and then we can see it in various different methods, in three different methods, basically, where we search for it, we find evidence. Um, which is not surprising because we're looking at the same data, but it just says different methods are consistent with each other. So not everybody does see echoes, I should say, and if you are interested in seeing the differences, we have a review article where it discusses what the differences in the methods, but it seems that uh, some search methods lead to echoes and others don't, and we're not exactly sure why. Uh, so the jury is still out on it. So let me conclude. Um, so we are still finding Einstein's demons in his great war. So this is basically the war between quantum mechanics, which he co-invented, and uh, gravi theory of gravity or general relativity, which he did invent uh, basically on his own. Um, so one battleground is the quantum nature of black holes. Uh, the stimulated Hawking radiation, I'd like to, I kind of, I try to convince you, leads to logarithmically delayed echoes at horizon frequency. Uh, and it probes quantum black hole microstructure. Uh, so if people are arguing about the nature of quantum black holes, there is in fact an experimental way to test it. Uh, there is tantalizing, though controversial hints for echoes in LIGO, 
but we don't know which events you expect to have louder echoes, what templates to use, which search method is best. Um, so that those are all open questions right now. And uh, we think we have the possible first measurement of estimated Hawking radiation, but the signal is not um, at the level of detection yet. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ayesh, for your interesting talk. And uh, if there is any question, please raise your hand and you can ask your question. One question, maybe. Yes, we have uh, Dr. Sheikh Jabari. Yeah, your mic is on. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Nirish. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Okay. okay. So, uh, do you have estimates whether uh, your proposed uh, signal is also detectable in LISA or other gravity wave detection? Yeah, I think it, it's all going to get much, bet much, much better. So there is. Um, so if if this uh, signal is real, or if the the, the our estimates of reflectivity is uh, reliable, then uh, they are all going to be much louder in LISA or uh, Einstein telescope. So all the future generations are going to do basic an order of magnitude better. So so they could they would certainly confirm or rule out uh, this proposal. But unfortunately, right now things are just at the margin uh, of being detectable. In fact, there was a paper just yesterday by. Yan Bei Chen and the Cal Caltech group who were doing this uh, in a way kind of hybrid with numerical simulations. And the problem is yeah, right now with LIGO, things are at the, right at the margin. But with the next generation, it's going to be better uh, like by an order of magnitude. Okay, thank you. And uh, I have a very small question. Uh, my question is about the memory of gravitational waves and uh, your echo uh, mm -hmm. uh, waves. And also yeah. the difference between the uh, quasi-normal modes, uh, how we can make differ different between this uh, type of... That, that's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. Uh, so I don't have really much to say about the memory effect. Uh, I, I expect there would be a memory effect uh, for echoes the same way that there is for ordinary gravitational waves. Uh, I don't think anyone has studied that, but I, I imagine that could be an interesting to, to look at, especially... Uh, but I mean, the problem is that memory effect is not something that you can directly measure. Uh, yes. You always kind of measure, uh, you can infer it from observations, but you don't directly measure it. But exactly how big it is, that's an interesting question that nobody has looked at. So that, I think that's an interesting thing to look at, I agree. Uh, and quasi-normal modes is actually a very interesting uh, story because it's not, this is an ongoing story uh, and there are arguments about how much quasi-normal modes should be taken seriously. Um, now, what happens is that if you introduce this, this boundary, the inner region, uh, the, the, me the membrane or the fuzzball or a fireball, it looks like basically yeah, the, the quasi-normal mode structure uh, drastically changes. So instead of the original quasi-normal mode of GR that uh, were kind of rapidly decaying, you get a, a, a tower of quasi-normal modes which have much lower frequency and decay much more slowly. There are basically mm -hmm. modes that are trapped and then kind of very slowly decay. Uh, yes. th that being said, if you just look at the signal itself, it looks like GR, you see GR for, for a long time, and then you see the echoes. So, so, it's, uh, so interpreting this change in the quasi-normal mode spectrum uh, and how that relates to the actual signal, it's, it's a tricky thing. Uh, so it, indeed, and, and the people are still arguing about this, even for general relativity itself, how a stable this quasi-normal mode spectrum is to say nonlinear effects or the variations in the potential. Um, but it's it, it, basically, I, the, the main, I guess, takeaway from this is that it's tricky to go from quasi-normal modes to uh, observations. 